um, what we can do. Um, that's shall we, shall we start? <laughs> okay. Um, I've, uh, my name's Wendy Fenton, and I'm the coordinator of the Humanitarian Practice Network here at the Humanitarian Policy Group within ODI. And I'd just like to welcome you to this session on which launches <coughs> our most recent network <coughs> paper, number 69, on common needs assessment and humanitarian action. Um, we've also got a large online audience signed up, about 50 people who signed up to watch online. And uh, later on in the, in the process today, uh, there will be a session on for questions and comments. And we welcome our online audience uh, to participate in that. Just remember, though, for those of you who are watching online, to, to keep your questions brief and, uh, and to the point, because sometimes we get rather long... Uh, long things that come through on the on the system and we're not able to address those. Um, I'd like to just to tell you a little bit about how the format will work. Uh, I'm going to introduce the participants in a minute, but we're going to give each of our two speakers uh, 15 minutes for their presentations and then we ha also have two discussants who are going to draw out some of the, the key themes and, and issues as they see it. That should take us uh, about 50 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have at least 30 minutes for uh, questions and comments after that. And our final 30 minutes from about 3 o'clock, we're going to have some refreshments over in the room next door. So please stay for 30 minutes or so uh, and talk to, talk to others, do some networking. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have you. So first of all, let me introduce our panelists. Um, on my far right is Richard Garfield. I've never been described that way before. <laughs> as, being on the, as being on the far right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean politically. Um, <laughs> Richard is the, is the primary author of the, of the Common Needs Assessment paper, but he's also a professor, his, his real job is he's a professor of public health and nursing at Columbia University. Um, and Richard has worked with health ministries in several countries and in malaria control before moving to Columbia University. His areas of research specialism include assessment of need in humanitarian crises, monitoring humanitarian recovery, <coughs> multi-sector rapid assessments, and non-communicable conditions in less developed countries. And he's written extensively on the subjects of disaster medicine, public health preparedness, and the monitoring and evaluation of humanitarian crises in a number of countries, including Iraq, Sudan, Cuba, Nicaragua, Liberia, Haiti, and the former Yugoslavia. Richard also authored a, a previous network paper for us, I think, a long time ago now, 1999. Um, and I wrote down the title of that and then instantly oh, forgot it. <laughs> but I'll, yes, if you look online, you'll be able to see. Maybe John knows, actually. <laughs> It was health, I think. It had health in the title. I think it was mainly about economic sanctions. Exactly. It was, yeah. yeah. Well done. Well, between us, we managed to get it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to introduce the, the other participants in detail when they speak, but I'll just uh, briefly say who they are now before Richard <coughs> starts. So on my um, near right <laughs> is Loretta Heber Girardet, and she's a disaster and in the Disaster and Vulnerability Policy section at OCHA. And I'll introduce her in more detail later. And on my far left is Dr. Randolph Kent. He's the director of the Humanitarian Futures Program at King's College London. And then on my immediate left is James Darcy, who's a senior research fellow at, at ODI and also one of my colleagues. <laughs> so without taking up too much more time, let me, uh, let me have Richard go ahead and start. Thank you. Um, I'll point out some key aspects of the paper and, and uh, <laughs> add a few comments here. Um, this is a paper from an individual investigator and a group of people who have been involved in uh, <coughs> needs assessments. You, you see the authors here. Um, and there was a fairly large group of people who, I turn it off, <laughs> who uh, reviewed and gave us very substantive uh, comments on the content and all. Um, I thought to write this paper because I've been involved in needs assessments. Um, what wasn't mentioned in my history there is that I was the first coordinator of the Health and Nutrition Tracking Service located at the World Health Organization, and I was asked to coordinate uh, the earlier generation of this stuff called uh, the IRA. 
we have moved along and uh, we are seeing needs and opportunities and problems that occur over and <coughs> over again. I think the world is demanding more and better information quicker and uh, we actually are delivering but we're not delivering anywhere near as much as we could and hopefully we will. So I'm anxious for us to get our ducks more in a row um, and uh, realize the potential that we have here. Um, and I have to give a quick comment here. Up there in, in, in too fuzzy for you to see, it says revised. And the reason it's revised is that there were several paragraphs in the initial version that unbeknownst to me uh, came from an earlier draft of the NEFT guidance. They were copied from there, which is inappropriate. And I, as primary author, I'm responsible for that. So it was revised, and those have been either taken out or referenced. Um, this is a definition of the common needs assessments that we um, used in a meeting in Bangkok after we had had a series of common assessments done in Pakistan, not including the one after the floods this year, but uh, Pakistan is a, is, a, is a crisis country that has had uh, a series of emergencies and needs assessments, and Myanmar um, two and a half years ago after Cyclone Nargis. Um, and I think it's a good definition, a time-bound, multi-sector, multi-stakeholder process of collecting, analyzing, and interpreting data to assess needs and inform decisions on humanitarian and early recovery responses. I don't know a better uh, statement than this, but there's an awful lot packed in there. And here is our problem, that we have identified um, in our minds a very nice goal of getting together and doing a quick assessment that helps to guide what the response is. But if but every one of these adjectives in there takes time and money. Um, to be multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder means you're going to be slower and you're going to have to deal with more complicated people <coughs> who may not really want to come to the table together. To do uh, the collecting of data is a question of particular skills that not everybody has. And if you've done one or two surveys, you're not ready necessarily to come along and do an emergency survey in an unknown area. Um, I say that because an my experience in <coughs> Haiti, Myanmar, and Pakistan is that there are local people and agencies who have some experience and think they're experts and um, I think make a lot of mistakes. Um, some mistakes which we can avoid if we, if we do a better job. Analyzing is not a political process of deliberation between different agencies. Analyzing is something that individual investigators have to collect, summarize, and compare data to see what it says to them. We can then share those impressions to come up with an overall picture. And that's really the beauty and the opportunity of a common needs assessment. Because more important than getting the data together is getting our organizations in some better coordination so that we respond more effectively together within <coughs> and outside of the UN. That's, that's my hope and promise of gathering information early among different agencies and stakeholders is to understand the needs and respond in a more coordinated fashion across agencies. So uh, what we've done is after each one of these three big assessments, Myanmar, Pakistan, and Haiti, we've had lots of people saying it was a terrible assessment, a terrible job was done. But when it comes time for the next one, the humanitarian community overall has a tremendous aspiration and hope that it will solve all problems and be great. So we're between despair and triumphalism in our approach to date. Um, I think we have to put those two together. We have to have more modest objectives for wh what we can achieve in a short time, and we will achieve them better if we do that and if we train. And as Lori will say, through a political process as well as a technical process, get our ducks more in a row. Um, there is really a long history, and some of you have been involved in this. There are many people who were involved I mean, we could go back further, but overall, the needs assessment framework, wh which was developed between agencies, helped to put indicators for analysis together, mainly within the UN system, and I guess with the World Bank as well. We, um, uh, we four clusters, um, health, nutrition, shelter, and WASH, got together <coughs> with um, the IRA tool, which was field tested in 12 countries and then applied in another eight, um, starting uh, um, 2008 to 2010. And I have to say, as the person helping to coordinate this, it didn't work very well. It was frustrating. 
the needs assessment task force of the IASC is now engaged in the process that Loretta will talk about with the mirror, which I think is already way beyond where we were with the IRA, and I have high hopes that we'll be collecting more useful, more effective information. From the document, um, this table helps to give some boundaries. Um, the, uh, the days involved from phase to phase are my own because I think that uh, I, I actually made wider, wider boundaries because individual disasters are a rather different one from another. Some move along quickly, some move along more slowly. But I really think that this um, mental organization helps to understand that the needs are different at different points in time. The most important single question is not to get accurate information, but to get information to people who are making decisions and utilizing resources. We are actually better at thinking about how to get good information than how to get useful information, because useful information has to do with who's going to be the consumer and how and when they need it to consume. Um, that's the biggest challenge. If you get people like me from a university together, we can figure out and we can agree on how to do it right. But how to do it effectively, university researchers are the worst. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, others aren't much better because they're depending on us. And I refer back to an ODI document that James Darcy <laughs> authored seven years ago. Um, on, on, I don't know your title either, but it was just on this question, and we are still stuck on this question. So <coughs> the problems with doing joint needs assessments are these, that we, we, ha we want them to do too much. We, we want everybody to buy in, but buy in means that they put their information needs in there as well. And sometimes it becomes a bidding war on who gets more in. So we tend to break the back of the camel by putting too many desires in for what we're going to collect information about. And it becomes heavier, slower, and less operative. I think overall we have too much faith in numbers. Now, I'm an epidemiologist, so I, my faith is numbers. Um, but we often collect numbers poorly and hope that <coughs> just the number sitting there will answer the question, rather than the analysis of data which is quantitative or qualitative in order to understand the overall picture. We focus too much on here's the number and don't ask me how it got there. And we don't compare information sources of various types enough to come up with the overall understanding. Um, we hope that numbers will speak for themselves, they don't. Numbers whisper for themselves. And we as analysts have to put our ear up next to the numbers and next to other things that are not numerical to find out what they're saying. And then I put at the bottom, this from my technical side, in the rush to get information out, we focus often too much on the agreements on how to do it rather than the mechanics. And uh, let me perhaps, if you are from agencies who work on these things, what I most want you to remember from my comments here today is that if you have the instrument in your hand and you don't go across the street and ask people those questions to see if they understand them. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, matter, no matter how little time you have, you have to take a little time. It might even be a half an hour, an hour to pretest. You have to check it out with some local people. If you don't, you will definitely be making important errors. You have to train your interviewers. It seems obvious if you sit in this room, but several of the large-scale uh, uh, surveys that have been done actually have not. They, oh yeah, we'll do that on the way, and it doesn't happen. Uh, you can guarantee that the information will be difficult to interpret. Um, training only needs to take a day, but with, without pre-testing training and field supervision, the information you're gathering is not going to be very useful. These things slow you down, and it's this side of the technical stuff that I am involved with more than the political stuff which is necessary to figure out how to get everybody on board and agreeing what to do. But um, most of what happens when we're talking about these things and preparing for them is the agreement side. We can agree on what we're going to do. If we don't pretest, train, and daily supervision in the field, the information's not going to be very useful. We had a training program last week in Chiang Mai, um, the second for training people on doing joint needs assessments as this um, uh, momentum is growing, uh, particularly among UN agencies but also with NGOs. And people there started with the concept that either you have qualitative information 
or you have quantitative information. And either we're looking at key informants and observations or we're doing household samples. And I don't think it's in either or. I think we have a continuum of information that becomes more quantitative as we have more time and reach closer to people's homes. But in the first days, is when most agencies are setting their overall objectives and their sense of what the problems are. So we, do, we really need to depend on observations of people who are coming through areas quickly and um, uh, uh, just a chat with the village leader or other local people to get a first impression to know what are the major areas here, which direction are we going, before we decide on the political process of what questions get into a more in-depth survey. characteristics of a good assessment? Timeliness. It's number one on my list on purpose because really good information that's a day after the funding decisions are made is almost useless. Relevance, coverage, transparency, and finally, but I think it really isn't on the bottom of the list, continuity. We eat, what we're doing in a joint needs assessment is short-term information as quickly as possible after an emergency has occurred. But we've hardly begun to think about how to compare that information from information that we gather later. That's where we're going to get good information when what we're doing is a baseline rather than a one-off and we can connect the dots to see how quickly in what areas people are doing a better or worse. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten where we want to be with joint <coughs> needs assessments, but once we do, we'll be moving on to the more rich area, I think, of following up and getting more information. And this is a conceptual summary of uh, over time, we get more precise in what we know. But the question is when are decisions made? How precise does it need to be to make a good decision? That's the relevant question. On the bottom here, you see, well, uh, th this is in Pakistan floods, uh, Cyclone Argus, and in, uh, in Haiti the time that it took for doing the different things involved in doing a joint needs assessment. Most important is that the plan on the bottom there uh, was much shorter. There are, there are a lot of things that take longer than you think. Um, and the good process going on now through the needs assessment task force and the MIRA will be to do some of these things that can be thought ahead <coughs> so that we don't have to start from scratch and take too much time afterwards. Here's a sentence from the document which I want to apologize for. Too often early rapid needs assessments attempt to address medium-term issues such as livelihoods that may be better addressed in later phases. Most of this document I, I started writing about two years ago and that's what I thought at the time but having been engaged in Haiti and in Pakistan a large-scale needs assessment, I would replace this with the, with the question of we should ask people what their priorities are. And it has to be phrased carefully to get good information. That means today, what is your most urgent need or needs? And then for tomorrow, what will be your most, most important needs? And when we've asked these things, a lot of times people are asking for recovery. People are asking, give me, give me food to eat today, but as quickly as possible, get me back to my home or give me a tool so that I can feed myself because I don't want to be depending on you showing up again. So I think actually livelihoods does have to come in. Not everywhere but where it's relevant, where the context makes it such. Uh, we should be thinking of that from the start. There's a lot more in here, but there's a lot more from other people to say. So I want to end with um, a reflection. It is necessary through the <coughs> political process for agencies to come together and agree on what needs to be done. We tend to do this in a very non-humble manner where we think having agreed on what reality is, it makes it so. There are a lot of things and a lot of people that are happening outside of whatever we're agreeing to do and what other, whatever our agencies are taking part in. Every time there has been one of these large needs assessments that I've been part of, other people are doing similar and related things that we only hear about later. And there are new kinds of information coming along rapidly that we need to learn how to bring into the process. So at one point in time, there's an agreement on what you collect and how to do it, perhaps. But the process of gathering information and the possibilities of using information are very dynamic. And this is going to be changing rapidly. So this is crowdsourcing information on radiation in Japan.
there are people with Geiger counters all over the place who are throwing in their daily observations. These are private people. It's remarkable as a possible check. That doesn't mean it's accurate. But it means that there's a mountain of information that we haven't scratched <coughs> before. And if you trace it over time from one place to another, the, the trends are actually pretty accurate, even though individual recordings may not be. We can learn a lot very cheaply from uh, uh, new sources. So this is just one example to open our minds. This, however, crowdsourcing is numerator information. It's unique events. You might call that the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there's also uh, uh, new opportunities for information about the denominator. In epidemiology, everything is rates so that we can compare things. So you need to know the events and you need to know the population from which it comes. And this is a project that I've been involved in in Haiti where we are collecting not information from people who have problems on their cell phones, but the movement of all cell phones in the country. Here is Haiti during Christmas and then in the earthquake. And then, you, you, you can't see it over here, there was a 12% decline in the phones that were in Port-au-Prince. They moved around the country. We found out where they were just by tracking every day all the cell phones. You can see here each week afterwards, on the weekends, people leave. On Easter, people left. Within four months, most people had returned to Port-au-Prince. That's denominator information. It's easier to collect numerator information when we spend the time and effort to get in a helicopter and go out. But we need denominators as well, and there are opportunities that we haven't thought about. So I'm thinking of this not as a question of herding cats, which is the way we usually do, but casting a net for a school of fish. Because there is a general movement in a direction, and there's an opportunity to coordinate it better. And there's one point I want to end on here. Yesterday, I left Chiang Mai to come here. <laughs> Excuse me. Out on the streets, I'm not this kind of guy who cries. <laughs> Um, out on the streets, youth organizations were collecting money for Japan. I thought this was unbelievable. Thailand, which had been oppressed by Japan in World War II and hasn't been uh, a great friend of Japan and has been m always a recipient of aid, there was a wide movement in this town to collect aid. Now, this adds up to almost no, no amount of money, but everybody was stopping on their uh, motorcycles and giving them some but. I think what we have in the situation in the world today is the opposite of donor fatigue. I think overall the world community is more interested and more serious about supporting people in need than ever before. And what this means is that we have the opportunity and responsibility to take that support and interest and make it effective by doing a better job in assessing needs initially and following it through over time. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I was wondering whether we should call everyone at the at the end or individually.